watching you from behind all morning, and this is a slightly different view. So, um, my name is Elin. Um, I'm giving Vex a well-deserved hour off for moderating. Uh, I will be leading a conversation with a stellar panel that I'm about to bring up. And what we will focus on is some of the answers to the questions we've just brought up. We've talked a lot about the responsibilities for individual developers, and now let's Let's open that. What can be done? What can be done at all levels? So we have a really amazing panel to come up here. Nigel is already ready, so start thinking about questions. Um, take the advantage of these people so you can ask them what they think. So let me bring up the panel. Panel. Let's start with, uh, with Claire Ingram. Uh, she is a researcher in the social consequences of code-based technologies. Come on up, Claire. And then we have, and then we have Johan Jorgensen, also known as Mr. Food Tech. We talked about, we talked about the industries, industries we may or may not want to go into. Now, is the industry of food something to be wary of ethically? And then let's bring up, up back up Martin, the CTO of Treton 37. We have Sara Öhman, who is a marketer who uses all these tools and all this data, and who I'm pretty sure knew I was getting divorced before I knew it myself. <laughs> and we have Raul, who is uh, our human rights lawyer, uh, expert in human rights, and also experienced from criminal court in Mexico City. So. Some very interesting discussions leading up to this panel. And finally, Jen Looper. Welcome. <laughs> Cloud advocate from Microsoft. So thrilled to have you all here um, in front of everyone. So let's just, let's just start. We've just started this morning with all the, we've started with 30 million Brits not being able to access their phones to go online because of a software outage people dying because of software problems. Uh, anyone in here is a parent in Stockholm? Raise a hand. Do I need to mention school platform from a plain user experience perspective? <laughs> let's not even bother about the public costs or the uh, security breaches. So let's start at the highest level. We've, you've heard a lot about the responsibilities for individual developers and what you should be thinking about. Let's start a, a bit higher. Are authorities, governments, and the law keeping up? as software is inching closer and closer and even into our physical bodies. Claire, what would you say if you look at other industries uh, where, where there have been catastrophic uh, consequences for humanity, such as the finance, financial systems, for example, how has the financial system handled this concept of criminal liability and civil? I think that's still very much evolving and emerging. I'm, I'm not sure we have an answer yet, but, but certainly the finance industry is a cautionary tale um, and, and something we would hope to avoid where finance and financiers have largely been left to self-regulate or, or for the market to regulate. Um, and, and I think that that's very difficult to justify after what we've seen in, after, in the financial crisis. If you take what we've seen there back to, to coders and, and code development, we see similar kinds of social complexity where you see social hierarchies, where you see power dynamics that, um, that limit the agency of individuals. But you also see uh, among developers and coders uh, technical structures, um, so, so code-based structures, the platform you build, uh, build on the, the coding language that you use that are also a kind of technical embeddedness that limit the agency of, of the individual developer or coder. Um, and so, so that's, that's something that, that regulators are trying 
trying to grapple with and are struggling to grapple with, especially as digital uh, or code development moves so incredibly fast, it's difficult for regulators to, to come in and say, you will do this, because by the time they've reached consensus, which itself takes a whole lot of time, the regulations that they've come up with are out of date. Um, and so, so, yeah, so it is incredibly difficult, um, and I'm not sure that we can reasonably expect regulators to, to come down with something coherent. Um, I think that, it, unfortunately, it, it has to be individual, but, but also company culture um, that, that helps us be responsible and, and do responsible things. So, so the challenges of regulation, because if you think even for the financial industry, it wouldn't be so difficult, but even they are struggling. And then obviously then for the, for the, for the coding or software <coughs> industry, it's even... It's Ex even exactly. I mean, that's what's happened in the finance industry is we've seen civil lawsuits, enormous civil lawsuits against companies um, because you can or originate behavior to, to a company, but it's very difficult to find where, who in that company was the individual concerned um, so do you keep the, do you hold the CEO accountable? Do you find the minion at the bottom and, and make their head roll? Um, it's, it's very difficult to establish causation when particularly companies are designed to, to kind of hide risk, right? You, you, you're, they're, they're risk taking entities. Um, and, and so how do you identify individuals and see where the cause is in a company? You can't, you have to hold the company responsible. Um, and, and even if you can find the cause in Inside that black box that is a company, how, how do you establish intention? How do you know whether they meant to, whether they were just negligent, whether they were compelled by a boss? Um, the, the kind of data trail, the empirical case, is a very difficult one to make. Um, and, and I think Raul particularly would know a lot about the, if, if you were to try and do this from a criminal perspective, how difficult it is, right? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Raul, when, when I talked to you, you said it, it's always about the hammer in yes. criminal court. So, so, <laughs> so and, and you've worked in some very serious criminal courts, and, and you said to me that it is unlikely that any individual developer would ever be held criminally responsible because you can't find a hammer. Is yeah, exactly. I, I made this comparison that uh, uh, if a person makes a hammer, uh, he or she could not be held responsible if that, if that hammer is uh, used to commit a crime because there's just not a nexus. So it's the same here. It's hard to point, pinpoint a person that did that piece of software that failed, and so we can hold that, that person criminally responsible. That is why usually people uh, go after the company. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that said, I mean, um, I remember 20 years ago, major companies could sort of wash their hands and say, it's unfortunate that our suppliers use child laborers, but it's, it's, not, it's not our problem. And five years ago, some technical companies could say, it's unfortunate that our customers are using our technology to, to, to harass uh, and imprison uh, people, individuals in their own countries. And, co and companies can't really say that anymore. That shift has happened. We have moved the responsibility for a company, uh, both towards suppliers and customers, from a human rights perspective, for example. Can you give some examples of that? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, well, a few years ago, the United Nations uh, entrusted Professor John Ruge to make uh, an instrument uh, regarding business and human rights. So he developed what now it's called the United, United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And now this instrument can be, uh, it applies to all industries, no matter the sector or no matter how big or small they are. Um, and it, it is uh, traditional, traditionally, states are the ones who are responsible uh, to protect and respect the human rights of people. But now companies also have the responsibility to respect the human rights of their stakeholders. And this is something that about 10 years ago people said couldn't happen. Yes, like um, I, I just read uh, a paper, uh, I was reading a paper that supposedly there was this AI recognition program that could tell uh, if people were homosexual. Uh, I then realized, well, I then read that it was debunked. However, if uh, such a program could be developed, it could not only infringe uh, the, right, the right to privacy of people, but also it could, be, uh, it could put some uh, people's life in danger. As we know, uh, it is illegal still in some places to be uh, homosexual. So I think these are the kind of questions that uh, developers or programmers should uh, be uh, questioning themselves. Uh, maybe they can say, oh, I'm just uh, programming this. It's not my fault that uh, these guys are using them for what is not meant to be. 
But that's like the same type of argument that uh, these clothing companies some years ago did. Like, oh, it's not my problem that uh, these suppliers are, uh, are infringing human rights. Uh, but now we know that they uh, had, a, had a responsibility and they paid a price. So uh, it, I think it, it's time that tech technological companies also take action and take responsibility. Right, and we, and we have seen that move from, from self-regulating to soft law into actual yeah. law in some cases. Jen, you represent one of the world's maybe the world's largest software company, mm -hmm. Microsoft. No, no pressure on, on you, no, no. <laughs> you here. <laughs> so how, what is your internal conversation of this at Microsoft? I mean, being that big, is it harder or easier for you than, say, 1337 to sort of lead the way in this? Well, we have a long history. Um, some of it is uh, not such a great history, <laughs> but it's been extremely interesting to watch the progress of this giant company. It's kind of like a giant cruise ship making a huge U-turn. And it has a lot to do with our current leadership, with um, whom we affectionately call Uncle Satya. <laughs> Satya, who is extremely interested in um, kind of bringing to life our corporate slogan, which I actually wrote down here because I want to make sure I get it right. <laughs> <So> <laughs> We're here to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So um, what we're trying to do is make sure that everyone in the company from top to bottom is trained up in some of these questions. We have a, a famous course called the Standards of Business Conduct. So it's really about um, everyone having to watch this very engaging content to get trained up. I've never been as well trained, and, and I've, I've been in the, in the industry for 19 years. I've never been as well trained on this stuff as I am at Microsoft, that's for sure. But it's been a very interesting evolution kind of watching these changes occur. Um, uh, do, you, do you have a feeling from your perspective that the sense of mm -hmm of the, the proximity to this nexus, to this hammer has, has shifted? Does Microsoft feel it owns more of the responsibility than it maybe did? I think there is, there is that, uh, but also employees are becoming much more, em not emboldened, but energized. Mm. I watched the, the Google walkout and the GitHub um, com um, kind of complaints that are happening via Twitter. There's, there's lots of employees who are really trying to hold their companies accountable. So it's coming bottom up now. It's a, it's a big thing. And I think uh, companies are definitely paying attention. They have to, or they're gonna lose people. And, really and, and I would um, assume then that those of us who work in countries, you mentioned this before our conversation where we have freer legislation and also maybe a, a freer labor market have a responsibility towards peers, developers in countries where maybe speaking up isn't as much of an option? Mm -hmm. Is that something, I mean, as an international company, it's, it must be different to do this in the States than in other countries where you're active. Yeah, for sure. I, I always have to check my privilege and think about, you know, I can say in the United States in Silicon Valley, oh, well, you know, you can just bail and get another job. But I've, I've had these conversations in places like Greece and other um, Eastern European countries where it's just not that easy. So we have to always be careful that we don't put so much pressure on the people at the bottom. We have to make sure to keep the top accountable. Sara, as I, as I, as I mentioned, I think you, you or <laughs> colleagues of you knew before I did that I was getting married, getting pregnant, buying a house, getting divorced. Tech savvy marketers today can do incredible things and sometimes terrifying things. Um, what is your take on, on regulation? I mean, you actually have been uh, faced with GDPR recently. That must have affected your business. Um, yes, of course. And for many clients, it, in, in short, terms, uh, short term, uh, it probably have affected their businesses uh, where they lost uh, some customers or, or so. But I think in, in long term, it's, it's, it's really positive because finally, um, my clients care about what kind of data the, that they that they have and what they can do with it as well. So it's probably positive in in that case, and especially I think we who, who have like being the tech savvy uh, marketers um, have like we have gotten the assignments. Like how how fast can you get this client on board? Uh, on board, what can you uh, know about this client? But and that has been like it's been really messy. And finally, I think um, companies are forced to care about the, the software and the, the platform and how they do marketing. So, so you would say it is a bit of a carrot and a stick when you have the the goody table of all this customer data or voter data or what it might be you need actual regulation to, to stop you from overusing it? Is that what you're saying, that your clients, when you, when you have that table and you have access to it, 
how well do the, these companies work in self-regulating? Uh, how, how well they work? Uh, self-regulating and saying we shouldn't touch this. Um, yeah, I think right. Right, what they are doing right now is saying we don't dare to use anything. <laughs> and I think that's not the way to go <laughs> about it either. Right. But like thinking about, okay, what's actually important to know about yeah. our clients? Uh, and where do we draw the line and <coughs> how do we use it? And, yeah. Because there's also potentially regulation <coughs> that would be damaging to, to a data-based sort of open and transparent uh, yeah. society. And I think it, it depends on where the regulation comes from or wh where the initiatives come from. Does it come from fear or does it come from, I actually want to know how this is going to work and how we're going to see it in the future? Yeah, I mean, can I jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the really interesting things for me is how uh, this notion of, but the data doesn't lie, has, has become a kind of mantra among people who, who work with data. And one of the, of course, the, the biggest issues is that there is bias contained in data, right? It, it doesn't say certain things. It overrepresents certain people in certain communities. Um, and companies, and, and particularly people who, who don't have good data training or don't have good technical training, just don't know that. Um, and so it's very difficult for for them to to understand how it is that just the use of data um, without reflecting on what is and isn't contained in it might actually be problematic. Um, and so, so as, as people who know more about data, one then has to educate them, not just build them a, a something or, or do some analytics for them, but, but actually educate them at the same time. And that's a real challenge um, given power dynamics, I guess. It's somewhat how data-based doesn't equal true and comprehensive automatically. In exactly. It's is we, we've, seen, we've seen the examples of extremely biased AI interfaces that have, that have um, uh, wrongly uh, chosen or deselected people from terrible places. And also machine learning algorithms that are collecting data the whole time. Um, they, they're, not, uh, it, they're not collecting data that is static and out there. Things change as a, as a result. It's the Hawthorne effect. Once, once people know that data are being collected, people change their behavior accordingly in, in order to be seen in a better light, maybe, or maybe just to kind of pervert the end of that particular algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's fascinating, but, but it's a challenge for, for marketers and, and also for people who are then building these algorithms because they're playing whack-a-mole the whole time, trying to, trying to figure out where the misdirection is they're coming from. They're playing what? Sorry, whack-a-mole? Yeah. This, this game where you, you know, <laughs> pop up and you pull. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. You, you want algorithms. I think yeah. this is a, a, we've talked about the industry of weapons, of gaming, of, of politics, of, of, of marketing. Uh, the industry of food, you'd think, is, you know, the most analog of them all. Yeah, that's uh, true. Why, why is software and food so important? Well, you know, that I, I'm, I'm enjoying listening in here because you talk about these small, insignificant industries like the financial industries or, you know, Airbus <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, we have to realize, and of course, all you guys in the room and girls as well, know that everything is data in the future. Um, and we will all eat according to what algorithms tell us in the future. And since we're not anything else than what we eat, uh, the ones constructing the algorithms will take control of our physical entities. That's pretty interesting. Scary. That means that someone can sit in, the, in an ivory tower, you know, pet a white cat, and actually control the lives of everyone on the planet through algorithms. And uh, is this significant? Yeah, sure. Today, roughly two-thirds of everyone who die on planet Earth dies from bad food habits. If Jeff Bezos wants us to eat more sugar because he wants to improve his bottom line, we will eat more sugar. And I think this is so fundamental that we realize the importance of algorithms in our day-to-day -day lives through food. And also the tremendous, immense responsibility that's putting on those people constructing the algorithms, of course, the values in them embedded in them. And I say, yeah, regulation, sure, we need to educate the regulators. Uh, the results, I don't know, but they need to know about this. Uh, coders, sure, they need to know this. We need a massive amount of whistleblowers out there. And data, hell no, I'm not giving away my data to anyone, so we need to take GDPR, you know, put it on steroids, and rapidly remove every type of data from the ownership of marketeers. Mm -hmm. 
They shouldn't be allowed to use any piece of data, at least not in the world of food. These two will meet outside tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll bring knives. Like it we'll after. Taking, like taking bets. No, but I think it's super, super important. And, and people don't realize this tremendous change of the food system. We take for granted, think that food is objects that, that we put in our mouths. But, but it's not, right? It's data. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> It, yeah. And it's, it, and it, so I think it's, and we'll get to that, and sort of how to how to think about when you get projects that are food related, maybe some things, some flags that should go up, and and so on. But let's move into. Um, so so there's some things that regulators should do, uh, some things they can't do. But then look at the companies and the and the power dynamics. Obviously, um, we know that some of these issues we saw were because of cost cuts and rushes and commercial concerns and competition. Martin, um, how often does it happen that a client asks you to build the equivalent of a car that doesn't have airbags? safety belts or functioning brakes. I mean, if we were to sort of equivalent, it's just, it's too expensive. We just don't fuss with the seat belts. How often does that happen and what do you do? I, uh, more often than you would imagine, actually. Uh, and, and it, but, but I don't think it's, it's from a place of malice. I, I don't think they're intentionally uh, doing it. Uh, I think if, if, you, if you continue on the car analogy and you think about things uh, like airbags and seat belts, it, it's things that you hope will never have to be used but it's very good that you have them. And in Sweden, when you take your driver's license, right, you, you, you are educated about the risks of driving a car. And, and then you have a bunch of people ordering software. I mean, we, we're just now seeing like CDOs in management groups. Often tech was under the CFO and they are doing, you know, ordering software and, and making the calls on what to do. And they don't fully understand what it is they're ordering. So, so I think, you know, it all comes down to being, you know, talking about those risks that exist, having people educated and, and guiding your clients and saying, listen, you don't want to do that. I, I, I hope these four features we want to put in will never have to be used. But if you need them, you're going to be really glad we built them now because it will cost you later. And transparency, right? Yeah. They should be forced to. So, no, I, I, I took out this stuff from, from this project. Yeah. <laughs> no. but, but that also puts a lot of pressure on the developers to, mm. to know that seat belts and airbags and, and, and the kind of code equivalents are, are necessary, right? Because, because one doesn't actually, in, in the case of software development, you don't actually know what, what weaknesses there will be at the end point necessarily, right? Um, so you can't anticipate all of it in, in the same way as you, you can with a car. Um, I mean, even just in the history of the car, a lot of those innovations came after the fact, right? But, but I mean, I think we know more now than we did before. Yeah. And I also think this is about like kind of the responsibility through all layers. Uh, it, I, I think the whole idea of, you know, I, I only wrote the code uh, up to specification. I, I think that died a long time yeah. ago. I think now we need to care about the end user and how the software is going to be used. Mm -hmm. If we don't know, we, we need to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the difference we're seeing now, that being a good software developer means caring about the product and the usage of the product uh, in order to give those recommendations uh, correctly. I, somebody building a house, I mean, I can order a house from somebody and tell them, like, you know, I, I like houses that look like this, but they're going to tell me how it structurally needs to be con built in order not to collapse on my head. And I can't tell them, you know, don't put that pillar there. I, a pillar there, I think it's stupid. Uh, and I think the same goes for software. We are those experts now. They're going to tell us how it should look and behave, and we need to tell them how it has to be built. That's actually my job. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a developer advocate. So my job used to be called a develop, um, evangelist. So we would go and you know talk about our Lord and Savior Azure, but <laughs> we don't do that anymore. <laughs> so instead of being you know sales and marketing, which in, in the US, we joke it's ABC, always be closing. So the developer advocate is always be helping, ABH, always be helping. So what we're trying to do is empower developers to ask the hard questions. If, if your problem is something that Azure can solve, awesome. If it's not, that's awesome. You know, we can find solutions that will empower developers to, to take control of their destinies a little bit more. It's a new, it's a new way of thinking, I think, in business. It's, and it is, is, it, is it receiving or 
is this coming from the top to have this, or is this something that's building from the bottom that the corporate management then has to respond to, would you say? I think both. I think, um, and I came from another company also as a developer advocate, so it's something that um, management understands is really important to have, to give legitimacy to your um, discussions of software, but also developers are kind of getting used to talking to DevRel, developer relations, developer advocates, about you know what can help you. So it's kind of both. Yuan, would you say, I mean, again, just as a, as a helpful tip to some of these people here in the, in the room, what are some companies that you think should be taking a bigger responsibility or where you as a developer should maybe ask three extra questions before you engage with developing for food-related purposes? You mean like Amazon? <laughs> well, if that's the answer. Yeah, I mean, I mean like that's, that's, of course, the obvious example. And I mean, like they have all that data of you. I mean, we talk a lot about anticipated e-commerce, you know, people just sending stuff to you. And that's how food will also go in the future. It will be services and it will just arrive at your home or wherever you are based on your data. And you will say, oh, good. I didn't know I wanted this. Thank you, Amazon. And, and they better have good algorithms then to provide me with the stuff that I really truly need. And I think this is a this is a, a big, big, big question, of course. How do you how do you construct those va algorithms and what type of values that go into them? Who should who should have the right to make decisions on my behalf based on my data? And we all need to be made more aware as an individual or individuals. You know, what type of responsibility, what type of power we give over to some of these companies out there. So that's a, a note to keep in, keep in mind. It, it, no, but it's power over our lives, our, our bodies. It, it's not our lives in social you know, space, it's our lives on planet Earth. It's that big. It's that big. It's that big. It is that big. And I just, before speaking to you, I never thought of food that way, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, Raul, from a business perspective, what's your advice to business leaders? How do you, as a business leader, because again, the power dynamics, you have a very large client and you have 1337 and you have salaries to pay and pensions to pay and you have to make sure you meet the owners, sort of, what is the recommendation to from sort of protect yourself from libel damages or even possibly criminal? Concerns. Yeah, I mean, I guess the short answer will be hire good lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, uh, I think uh, most uh, important will be uh, that uh, you know the law, you follow the law, but also you use your common sense, like don't oversell your products, or and uh, finally um, hire more than good lawyers, hire good advisors, because uh, lawyers is when things go wrong and you don't want things to go to that place. Um, I think with having, we, we have been listening to you and I think sometimes uh, business leaders might say that, okay, I will take this decision because it appears to be legal, it's in the line, maybe it's legal, maybe not, I will take the risk, I will calculate if it's a risk, but at the end, uh, the, the only person that can, uh, the only people that can uh, uh, say that that's, that's legal or illegal, it's a court of justice, a judge or a magistrate. And I but Raul, now I have to, no, 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 we can't just ha <laughs> you know, have good legal advisors because they will always say, it's legal, you will get away with it. We I think we need to hire good philosophers <laughs> instead in order to, to make sure that we wouldn't even get into that space in the first. I mean, I think the law, it's, uh, uh, like I said, uh, law is, uh, technology moves faster than law, of course, Laws, but always law catches up. And that's what we've seen with uh, GDPR and the privacy. It's, go it's getting there. It's, uh, before there was nothing, now the GDPR, and th we can see that there's still some, some uh, things that could improve. But it's getting there. I, I don't think it's a good idea just to push it uh, but, uh, but just I think like that. The question of whether law is enough is a good one, because law, law is, as, as you say, lags behind, right? Yeah, yeah, things yeah. can be legal and still harmful. Um, and, and it's that question of what is harmful that maybe the advisors that you identify um, would, would be useful in, but, but also maybe if you empower employees through, through education projects, yeah, education. Um, that, that that might actually help help not even getting to the point of is this legal, but, but ask the, the, the more immediate question of can, can this be harmful and, and what do we do about it? Do we need seat belts? Yeah, in, in Mexico we have a saying that's like, oh yeah, yes, uh, the town uh, uh, closed down the well after a kid died. So the, 
this is not to get there, right? Not to get uh, that uh, the software harms people and they're like, oh, we could have done this, we could have done that. And then after that, then there comes the law, right? That it's developed a new law uh, and then uh, your company will get uh, sued, your, comp your brand will get st stained for some reason and it will hurt uh, your business. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said uh, hire, hire good advisors, uh, not probably in, uh, of lawyers, but not, uh, it's better if you, you uh, hire advisors so you cannot arrive to that place. I think it's interesting what you said about common sense, like that everyone should have common sense and see things that are going to happen. And I think this comes down to education, like literally K-12 education. <laughs> like We need to make sure that people are trained up in basic ethics and basic philosophy and basic humanities. This is being absolutely destroyed in the United States, mm -hmm. which in my opinion is why we have so many problems in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so. Um, so, so you concur I'm, on the philosophy more the humanities? I'm coming from the humanities, so this is huge bias on my part. So. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> liberal yeah. arts for the women. Absolutely. Yeah, go yeah. But yeah, no, I, I, I think it's both. Like, I, I think it's both because I, I, I do believe in a philosophical aspect. And, you know, as we, we talked, or as I had in the keynote <laughs> about, we, we kind of replaced God or ethics with, uh, with you know, capitalism and, and science. And, and, you know, the primary measure of, of success now is, is how much profit you're making. And, and, and as that is driving development forward, uh, you know, we need philosophers to think about this in a different way. But then there's questions, you know, like GDPR, uh, which need to be legislated. Because when we then see these huge fines, we actually see the market responding to them, right? That there's, there's actually being actions taken now that people see that they can be punished monetarily. Mm -hmm. And I think the next one up here is going to be, uh, you know, the trolley problem, the self-driving car problem. Mm -hmm. That's not something that can be left up to individual companies to decide, you know, who the car is going to kill. We're quantifying the value of human life so, that needs to be law, uh, more than law. It needs to be something that's globally equivalent because it can't change just because you cross a border that human life is valued differently. Mm. Especially when business is global. I mean, obviously, trying to level the playing field. If you yeah. have to compete with someone who doesn't have to comply, then that's, again, huge questions. But, but, but Sara, just seeing as someone who, who, who is in that sort of boundary, I mean, in some ways, marketing was sort of the first major domain where we really started using all this personal data. Uh, and, and enormous possibilities opened up. And, and it, is, it is both terrifying and liberating to have someone predict what you want. It is liberating to open up that food delivery app and it just tells you exactly how many liters of milk you need and you don't have to think about it. But there's also that sort of idea of, of the balance. So corporate responsibility in your domain uh, is this something your clients, you're a freelancer, so do your clients involve you in that decision? Do you force yourself into that decision? Do they ask for your opinion on where to draw the line? Um, yeah, but I think the, the knowledge of the, of the client is really important and now they've learned that if they apply data to a platform that could be used for other purposes, but if you were to like really do corporate responsible marketing, you would say you would never go on any platform because f but even though you, you're not applying your own data to these platforms, they still have it. And typing in like food specifications on interest on, on Facebook, uh, you, you see that maybe that's, that's a good way to do, then you're not using any other data, but Facebook knows so much about us. So the, the, the real like, suggested would be to not use any of them at so, all. So it, there's this constant sort of gray zone that you move in. Yes. And, and, and what, how, do you, how do you handle that as a, as a person? You recommend things to these companies and then they do as you say, probably. So where, <laughs> where, do, you, where do you sort of, where do you draw the line? Where I draw the line? Oh, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big question because you get like asked every day to target people uh, based on so many things, especially maybe this person is getting divorced. Facebook know that they have this life pattern patents that, that, that they know that if you're listening to Spice Girls one day, probably that will mean like... Ding, <laughs> ding, ding, the else. Spice Girls reference, yes! yes. <laughs> the uh, panel succeeded. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's like the decision you draw, like you need to think about everything that every day. 
Mm. But I, I must chip in here a little because I mean, we all know that we're at the, some sort of a nexus in the history of humans on this planet. We really brought this planet to almost complete destruction. And now we need to turn this around. And it's also a personal question, which side of history do you want to be on? So this really boils down to personal decisions because you can always walk out. You can always get another job. And I think the personal thing, I mean, like the, this, this notion of do no evil, I think that's up, I, I think it's free now because I think they scrapped it right at Google. Well, it, do was, no harm. it was against yes, us. No harm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not evil anymore, so. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> do no evil. Just take that. It's free. So, so and, and embrace that. Yeah. So, but what would, would what would the evil be? So for me, it would be like quitting my job, never working with digital marketing. That's again. a very good decision. I'm probably. moving to the mountains. <laughs> no, there are other things to do. I mean, like <laughs> but, eight o'clock, take me bets. No, no. I, I mean, the, the the issue here is that evil is subjective, right? Yeah. So what's evil to you might not be evil to me. I think there are a couple of very objective uh, definitions. Probably, of but there's probably people that would argue against you on those uh, there's somewhere a gray, There's the a gray scale, of yeah. course, but yeah. there's tr truly black and white. Uh, well. So that's what I mean. I, I think it's, it's, it will be acceptable for certain individuals to take certain jobs and, and certain individuals to, to not take certain jobs. And we had a talk here previously that talked about, you know, where's your personal boundary? Do you work with weapons? Do you work with gambling? Do you work, you know, wh where do you draw the line? What's ethical for you? I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves more often now. And I think what you were saying also uh, was really important, like have the skill, because if you know what these platforms can do and what you can do with it, then you have the skill and then you know where to draw the line because you n need to know what it's about as well. And, and, and also, I mean, to, to do intentional harm is one thing, but to do unintentional harm is, is a very uncomfortable place to be as well. Claire, wh why is it that, I mean, once something happens, we start looking for the culprit, right? The immediate, like the, a plane falls out of the sky, which developer made the mistake here? Why do you think we're so quick to, to, uh, to look for the developer to blame, to look for the data, to look for the, the, the code that malfunctioned? I mean, frankly, it's just an oversimplification, right? It, it, it comes from a lack of understanding or lack of perception around how complex the system actually is. As I said at the beginning, both socially, in terms of social hierarchies and power and clients and bosses, but, but also in, in terms of the technologies that you're using, in terms of if, if you use, I don't know, Flash, um, how liable are you for, for the weaknesses of the, of the particular technology that you've that you've used, not not very, um, but people who don't fully understand those dynamics would would go all the way down to the developer just because there is this perception that you we build things and 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 that we have this ex ante responsibility, and it is very difficult to really hold people develop accountable without considering the the context in which they operate. I I thought that was interesting, <laughs> Matt, and you said that Bo the Boeing was a, was was and wasn't a software problem. But that it wasn't any individual developer that was at fault in this case. Well, I, I mean, we we don't know yet, but I, I don't think it was because the whole idea of it was it, it was a feature that maybe wasn't needed. It was code that maybe just shouldn't never have been written, because what Boeing was trying to achieve was they were trying to achieve the marketing that this plane's fl plane flies like its predecessors. They want to be able to say that that you don't need to train your pilots extensively. It's just a two-hour course on an iPad. Don't worry about it. And that's why they, when they build the MCAS, they did, didn't you know m highlight it in the documentation, the training, because th they wanted to sell it as the old plane but better. So maybe if they just didn't build that software and said, no, it's not the old plane, but better. You know, you're going to have to learn some new skills. It flies differently. You need to figure, figure out these things. Uh, then everything would have been fine. Uh, so that's why I don't, I mean, the, the only case where I think you know, the developers maybe uh, should have questioned it would somebody should have said to a product owner, maybe they did. Like, is this feature even necessary? Why are we building this? This is this is training. This is not this is not supposed to be solved in software. Uh, I don't know. Is it is it fair though? I mean, in the end, looking at power dynamics and social structures, you I mean, you are a developer, Martin, but you are also an employer. Yes. There are people here who are salaried by your company, yeah. and so it's one thing for you to say that 
put your hand up and blow the whistle. Is it really fair to put that expectation on individual developers morally? I think it's up to each individual to decide. I, I think we as, as people have um, need to make those calls for ourselves. And uh, I mean, if, if somebody pays me salary and tells me to go murder someone, like, I'm not just going to blindly do it. Uh, and maybe that's just because it's illegal or maybe that's my moral code, right? But, but the, the, this, these are the questions we need to ask our, ourselves. Like, how far am I willing to go and what's okay just because I'm getting paid for it? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't really think that that's, that's like a valid argument, uh, at least not in, in like Europe, uh, most of Europe and the US. Uh, there's always options for you. There might be places where you don't have options, but I think here as a software developer, it, it's, we're such an industry in crisis right now. Like anybody that knows a little bit JavaScript is employed immediately. It's it's like it's ridiculous. May I ask you, Jen, a question? Me. I mean, because y you have this extensive training at Microsoft and what to do and not to do, right? H how would you say that? H does that affect the way coders code? Well, I'm a developer advocate, so I'm not shipping software, but every single person in the company, that's 100,000 of your closest friends, are trained up in the standards of business conduct. And it really does. It really does impact the way you feel and the way you think. Um, and that's not the only training we do, so it's really a constant barrage of, of training. And um, I, I feel like it really has impacted the culture and, uh, and the way people think and act. We're pretty cognizant of what we're up to. I want to kind of pitch it back to, to you about what about all the outsourced folks? Because mm. my impression was the um, the airplane problem was a, uh, caused by outsourced software coming perhaps from India. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of other cultural things that we're not we're not maybe talking about that we could. Yeah. But for us, in you know, for us in Redmond, you know, we are trained up, man. <laughs> that that feels kind of unique. It seems kind of unique that you're trained that way. I don't know. I've never worked in such a Mark, huge Mark, company. Do you, you, you train them? <laughs> Your coders? We talk a lot about it. I wouldn't say we have like specific training. So, so uh, but, but I mean, coming back to the kind of outsource, not outsource, I, I want to I wanna tackle that one for a while. I, I think that's like one of the positive things we've gotten from thinking more about Agile and how we develop software is from having the whole team engaged in the product. And we're talking more about building the product and understanding the business and doing things together. And you know, when we kind of send away specifications, like, like it was when I did my first job, like I got specifications, inputs, outputs, you just code it. Don't care about what the software does. Mm -hmm. I, I think we remove um, we, we remove the developer as an expert in building software from the equation. And I think that's dangerous. I think that's dangerous. You wouldn't build a house that way. Like, you know, just pile these bricks here. Don't, don't care about what I'm going to do with the bricks later. Uh, you want to hear from the expert, like what the consequences of having those bricks there in that formation is going to be. Uh, so, so I think there, that's a shift that happened a few user, years ago with Agile. I think we, it's going to intensify. I think the next thing is, you know, we need to put security experts inside of the teams and not on the outside mm -hmm. to, you know, build that in even more. Uh, so there's definitely more we can do, but, but I think more and more having teams that actually care about the product yeah. is, is core, like, you know, like you're saying what you're doing in Redmond. Mm -hmm. Can Thank I, you. yeah, can I add something? I mean, something that, that I think that we're, we're focusing in on is, is decisions as discrete events, right? Like this one decision and you make a decision at that point. Of course, there are multiple decisions and we know that, that human psychology um, things sort of change over time when you have these multiple decisions. So it could be ethical creep. You start off going, okay, this one, this time I'll just not include that spec because the client doesn't want it. And, and the next time it's something larger and it's something larger and you justify it to yourself until you're suddenly designing algorithms that target drones at civilians. So, so there is this this creep. I mean, uh, I'm of course, being a bit hyperbolic, but but that that happens, and, and that's something that that culturally um, you can't necessarily tackle with education. Maybe you ha you can tackle if if you have the right kind of um, yeah, like colleagues and and this kind of thing. So so that's the the one thing. Um, but but the other is is just uh, the the difficulties of of making making it known that, that there are problems um, in, in, in a company because you can have all the education in the world and if you don't have a boss who's approachable, um, 
But I think it, it's, it's interesting. It, it also boils down to, to vague stuff like morale, because coders always tend to be very, you know, black and white to some extent. So does it work? Does it not work? Is it legal? Is it not? You know, that type. So when I met a lot, lot of coders in that type of discussions, and, and they tend to, no, it's legal. So I can do that. Uh, is, is, it, is it something we want? No, no, I mean, I mean, for me, it's about like uh, if I if I dial it back, like I think uh, it was at least 20 years ago when I was uh, doing my uh, my thesis on uh, ethics of artificial intelligence, and and I I started talking to a bunch of these researchers doing research in artificial intelligence and, and posing all these questions, and they're going like. This is just research. Like I'm not responsible for anything. Like I'm just bringing up the knowledge, and somebody is going to implement it, and it's it's their problem. Like, and and, and I think that is slowly That's washing changing. away. It's changing. For That's sure. changing. So now we're starting to claim responsibility for the knowledge we bring forth, and I think that's the big shift. That's the big shift. We can't claim like, hey, I'm only a hammer manufacturer. Like, if somebody bludges somebody in the head with that hammer, look, it's not my fault. Mm -hmm. Like, now we need to figure out, you know, this is a hammer. These are the proper uses of the hammer. How are we going to make sure nobody uses the hammer for evil? You know, is there a safeguard in the hammer? Okay, now this example is getting ridiculous, but, but you get the point. <laughs> cool. but, but you can you just move a little bit further from that. You do have do have products that are removed from certain markets. I mean, we've seen that recently, even in the States now, when Walmart discontinued some sales. We make, we make that decision because you see a consequence of unintended use. Yeah. And and what Raul also said about, about, um, uh, about human rights, I mean, the equivalent of your outsourcing or your, your sort of con continuous compounded creeping of ethics is at some point a company like Ericsson or H&M doesn't get away with that anymore. And it, and it did 10 years ago. Uh, so yeah. it's I was just w wanted to ask if, uh, if, if you as programmers or developers uh, are taught this uh, code of conduct of ethics and uh, are you taught this or, or no one knows about this and just a few people, I just saw there was this association committee machinery code of co ethic, code of ethical code of conduct, but I don't know if you actually, people actually read it or it's just there for uh, I mean, I mean, I, for, for me, it's uh, one of those things I don't, don't think enough people read. Like we could mm. see the hands raised here during, during the keynote, how many people actually knew uh, about the, the, the software engineering code of conduct. And I mean, for me, it's always been, been a passion because I, I love philosophy. So I, I elected a course which was, you know, ethics and software, mm -hmm. which was more about religion and ethics. And we, you know, talked about ancient philosophers and tried to kind of see how that, those concepts apply to software. But if you don't, if you if you're not interested, I know I don't know how universities now work. I haven't been there for, for a long time. But in, back in my day, if you weren't interested, uh, like you didn't you didn't hear about it. Like it was just like you you heard more about licenses and you know uh, should I use uh, LGPL or GPL or GPLv2? Like that was that made sense. Like we that we talked about licenses, uh, not about ethics. I want to let the audience in for questions in just a couple of minutes. So this is their time to think and write down your question. Take that as a, as a threat, otherwise I'll just throw <laughs> Nigel at you aimlessly. But before we end the panel here, I want to ask each one of you to give, <coughs> I mean, this is, this is a massive, obviously complex question that we're asking you, but just to think of examples that can be done now, right now, that could be done at this moment. For example, uh, what do you think could be done within law, like right now for this? I, I believe that uh, these soft law instruments are little by little, like uh, in other industries, is going to be, is going to become hard law. Like I said, the soft law is, is the beginning, is, is the, the test, and then it's going to evolve into being hard law and it's going to be mandatory. I see, uh, I saw that there's this movement where people are actually uh, saying that developers, programmers should have a certification as a lawyer or as a doctor. Uh, and they, they, they should even take a, um, I forgot the name of the medical uh, oath, uh, hypo yeah, oath, yeah. that to do no harm. Yeah. Uh, so I believe that maybe that could be a solution uh, to have an organism that regulates uh, the certification of programmers. Mm. Uh, Claire, what do you think? I mean, you you teach, and you were you in your when you were active at school. It's a very high level of education. What do you think should be done at schools and universities, and maybe even at lower grades? So, so I teach particularly at a business school, and I think one of the the big difficulties is that people who get business education get business education. They they have very little technical education, mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that that I personally do, and and that people that I work with, is is actually try to teach these graduates 
A, how little they know about technology, but, but to teach them some, some basics so at least there, there is some sort of starting point um, where you're actually speaking the same language. They, they understand a bit about data, they understand a little bit about security, and, and they also understand that the technology is not a panacea for everything, um, that maybe, maybe actually you know, business, business leaders have to take some responsibility. And, and Yuan, what do you think? Anything that could happen in authorities or governments, regulators right now? Yeah, of course, they need to get up to speed on, on what's happening and, and understand this because they don't, right? Mm. And then uh, they should advocate for openness and transparency. I think that's, that's the most important step they can take. Mm. Jen, what should businesses do? I think that we have to remember that idea that if you see something, say something, and that comes from managers and employees. So managers need to be, you know, need to advocate for their employees, and employees need to advocate for themselves so to make sure that um, everyone's in aligned with the code of ethics that every company ought to have. Sara, what do you what do you want to see happen in the marketing profession? What do you want your peers and in your industry to do right now? Um, I must say the same. Like, Technical education for all marketers. That's something I'm really looking into and like exploring. But uh, I was I didn't know about the the code of conduct that you showed, and I think that should be for marketers as well. I don't know who will do it, but some should. <laughs> Someone should. A Hippocratic you. oath yeah. for marketers. You. Go, you go. <laughs> uh, and and Martin, what do you think needs to happen inside companies? What conversation needs to be had inside the companies? I'm going to go with Jen on this one. I mean, I, I think it's uh, it, it should be inside of a company. It has to be easy to be able to have those conversations without fear. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, if you can have those conversations, you can come up with creative solutions, uh, which will allow you to both act right and still achieve your goals. Uh, so I think you you need to create a climate where, where there's not no fear of having these conversations. I, I think that's important. Uh, so create that comfort that you know I can go to my manager or my my team lead or whatever, and they're going to support me to talk to the client in, in this thing if it, if it's needed. Um, I, I think that I, I think everybody needs to feel that in order to do the right thing. All right, who wants Nigel? <laughs> Give me a hand. Here we go. Oh, and, throw and it. Now, and now throw I will, sorry, I will instruct you carefully. I will throw it short distances. Nigel is a <laughs> little gentle, <laughs> gentle, and speak into the black, and then we'll be fine. See, I think I can get it all the way to you here. Whoops. Throw <laughs> 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 so, uh, Thank you. Oh, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for good discussion. Um, so you were talking about a bit about this um, you know, the hammer manufacturer being neutral, and, but that you can't really necessarily absolve yourself from responsibility for people using your hammer for bad things. Um, but that has, has me thinking that there are some technologies that by their nature are both good and bad. Um, one prime example being privacy protections and cryptography, which is very important for things like whistleblower protection and political activism and dictatorships and so on. But it also can be used for terrible things like distributing child pornography and assassinations as a service. Um, so what are your thoughts on developer uh, responsibility with regard to these kinds of two-faced technologies? All right, any takers? Well, that's a very good question. That comes back to the question of what's black and white and what's gray, right? So uh, a hammer might be a good example. Guns, perhaps an even better one. Guns don't kill people. People, people kill, kill them, people. or whatever. <laughs> no, guns kill people. Uh, uh, Gunpowder, another one. Fireworks or guns, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. A lot of lot of the stuff that we're building is is infrastructure. Uh, knives, good for you no know, cutting meat. Good for killing people. Hammers. Uh, so so I think there are certain things here that we don't have a plain answer to. But I think there's also a distinction between ex ante, so prior and after. Um, and and the reality is that, that you can't know necessarily prior. Um, and so you do things with the very 
best possible intentions um, and, and as best you possibly can. You put in all of the safety features. Um, and, and if things get misused and misconstrued, th that is just a natural consequence and, and that is context that needs to be taken into account in, in liability after the fact. Um, it, it, is, it is a losing mission to try and prevent all possible harm. You'll, you'll bend yourself over backwards until you break, um, but, but one takes very reasonable precautions and does the best one can. Um, but yeah, it could, right. could be some sort of a test. Could this be used for really, really bad stuff? But, uh, but unintended consequences, the, the very nature of them is that they are black swans. Yeah. Um, they, they are so, uh, I mean, Tor may be, may be reasonably foreseeable, um, but, but in, some in some cases, perhaps the existence of the technology for positive things justifies its existence, even though it, it perhaps later becomes perverted. Um, it, but it is, it's an exigent question. I mean, I don't know, do you have an answer? <laughs> Go on then. I, I think that we can also make the comparison with uh, doctors or lawyers or even when we're driving a car. If we do everything possible to respect the protocols, the law or what is expected of a uh, good use of what we're doing and the outcome is negative, then we bear no responsibility. If a doctor per performs a, uh, a surgery and the patient dies but he followed the protocol, the rules, then he bears no responsibility. If we drive a car and we follow the traffic rules and we have an accident and somebody gets injured, we bear no responsibility. So it's, it's about following the rules, I will say. And transparently. Yep. Yeah. Transparent. Uh, uh, and I think there's also an aspect in, in you know, so we're, we're building these uh, frameworks or base technologies and things like that. And, and you know, if somebody wants to mis misuse it, they can. But what, what we can do is we can actually make a take, take a stand in, in that thing. We could actually uh, put up license agreements that say like you not to be used in, in this way. And you know somebody's going to do it anyway. They don't. They, you know, evil people don't care about the license. But at least that way, you you have an intention of of, of the thing you're you're coming at. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also been a, a thing thing coming coming out from the uh, software community. Like everything should be so free. We don't want to impose anything on anyone, and it's up to everybody's uh, le like individual uh, thing to do whatever they want. And I think maybe we need to think about that. Like. What if what if we you know put in like the uh, Linux uh, license agreement you not to be used for these types of uh, things like what what if that was a thing I don't know Do you have any other questions over here we Nice throw <laughs> Nice All right so um, thank you it's been a great discussion we've mostly been talking about how to avoid good software doing bad things but how about designing software to prevent people doing bad things. Like, I'm going to the movie Minority Report, right? Like, what if we went the other direction, and where do we draw the line about preventing bad people doing bad things with good software? Wow, you, you want to play, want to bring God back. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Slippery slope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, you, you say Minority Report, you know, I say Space Odyssey, you know, th there's... <laughs> eventually, uh, I'm, you know, being a little bit realist, a little bit dystopian, I think that might backfire uh, on us. So I think we should be very, very cautious uh, with trying to build up software that, that, that controls us. I, I think we need to stay in control. Sara, this is actually something you and I talked about because clearly what marketing does is actively change behaviors. You can, you can actually change, and that's what marketing has done way before it was digital. Let's be clear on that. A lot of this isn't new because we have code, but marketing has always done that. It's made us change our opinions and our behaviors. Mm -hmm. So you do this in some ways uh, already, but you drew the line between, uh, between behaviors and opinions when I talked to you. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I try to remember what what we were <laughs> talking about, and it's, um, so uh, there is. Uh, we, I think we talked about there's one thing uh, trying to to target people's behavior and if mm -hmm. like what kind of food they had, but it's like your opinions. Yes, they might be really private to you, and like is that something you you want to target or not? And then of course you can build so it would it would be harder to target people's opinion. And Facebook is trying to work with this already, but 
uh, I think it will like people will find find their way anyway. But of yeah, course, we, it could help making it. And we have seen yeah. their examples of voter suppression and of, yeah. of shifting, just making people stay home and so on. I, I, th I think just chip in here a little. I mean, uh, we want people to change behavior, obviously, because otherwise the planet will die and, and, uh, and we will die too, right? So, so we need to change behavior and, and, uh, and software will need to be a part of that. Uh, but then you can put the question, is it software or is it culture that we're talking about here? So we need to, need to perhaps move things through culture and software needs to be part of that cultural shift. I don't think software can run and be the culture, but it can be part of something. I think that, uh, return back to the real question about uh, say, saying someone's guilty or even killing someone, like the other day I was uh, on Facebook and I got this uh, kind of game for the Red Cro from the Red Cross and it's about a, uh, uh, an, a hypothetical scenario when there's a, an AI uh, program that's designed to kill people that cross an uh, imaginary border. And then uh, the, the program talks to you uh, imaginarily and says, okay, I've detected this car who's coming in like, I don't know, 100 kilometers per hour. It's not going to stop. He already passed the point of, uh, of stopping. He's gonna cross the border. Do you want me to take care of it or uh, you want to stay in control? So and then it, that, uh, that, was, uh, that kind of game was designed to, to make you think, uh, are, you, are we willing, already uh, ready to, to, to leave these kind of decisions to a machine? I would say no. I think, like you said, there's always someone, some a human being has to, ha has to have control. It can, it can be made to help you make the decision, but at the end, it's al it always has to be a human. Because, yeah, then, then the, res the question of responsibility goes, yeah, even further. <laughs> I mean, there's a really, really, really good uh, research done on the trolley problem, uh, which I hope most of you know it. It's, uh, you know, if, if a rail railway car is going uh, to hit somebody, you have two different sets of people on the tracks. You have to decide which one get, gets hit by, by the, uh, the cart. So, so, so they did, uh, I think they asked four million people to play an online game with a self-driving car to select who's going to die. Uh, show a bunch of interesting things, but but one uh, of the more interesting aspects of it is even if every car on the planet was self-driving, we would actually have less accident and make better decisions, save more lives. People are still not ready to sit in a car that would kill them. Right? It's 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 because you don't want to have that feeling saying like you know if the if I'm about to hit a child my car will, will swerve and hit the wall uh, and kill me because they're younger so they deserve to live uh, you don't want a machine making that decision for you even though in general the amount of accidents would go down and I I think this you know it comes back to this we're not ready to to give up control to the machines. Right, edging in on your lunch break. I have one question over there. Where is Nigel? Do it, do a, do a two throw if you can't throw it all the way. If, yeah, of course you could do it all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Silly me. Is it still working? Yes, good. Uh, closer. Uh, yes, so thank you for the interesting discussion. I was just going to ask you about something that Claire, you mentioned right at the beginning in your first opening remark. And it's taken just like as a fact in everyone but in this room that in software, everything goes so fast. In technology, everything goes so fast that the regulators can never keep up. But why do you think that specifically our industry gets that excuse? Like other industries, they're not allowed to just go fast. You know, the drugs need to wait. You know, airplanes need to wait for approval. And sometimes things still go wrong. But we kind of get away with it. We're just like, oh, we're so fast that we can, you know. <laughs> do you have, anybody have any thoughts on what makes technology special? I mean, I can I can give a shot at that. I mean, the main thing just being that the the actual form it takes is completely different, right? If you think about drugs, if you think about car manufacturing, um, they they have physical points where you can actually physically stop it from occurring. One of the things with with 
software development is, is that you don't need a, a great big infrastructure in order to do it. It is by its nature mobile. It could happen here, it could happen in Ukraine, it could happen in South Africa. And that makes it very, very difficult for a regulator in a single country um, to actually enforce a set of regulations to, to stop or slow down a particular technological development in the case of software development. Um, so, so it is just practical um, rather than rather than anything else. Um. I would say in my, my personal opinion would be also that uh, now it, it's getting more attention, these kind of issues in, in, the, in the public, in the general media. Uh, so that's why I think now uh, uh, tech companies are going to have more and more responsibilities and these laws are going to get uh, tighter and tighter. I don't know if they're going to be to a place of like uh, the drugs where you, ha you have to wait. But I think definitely uh, laws are going to, 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 to become tighter uh, in this area. Uh, my, my, my only thing of this is, is it, we're, it's a young industry. I, I think you know. I think these things develop with time, and and you know we're the young ones on the block. We haven't been around for enough time for kind of everything to settle in and everybody to understand how it's going to work and and things like that. So so I, so I think as you know, we age, there will be more of it coming up. But but I think one last point is just that um, one one of the big concerns is being left behind because one is following regulations. So we already see that GDPR has hand, had a kind of chilling effect on, on algorithm development, on things that companies are willing to do. And it has meant that people in countries where there is no equivalent to GDPR are streets ahead. And so then then what happens? Do, do we, are we digital laggards because we're following the rules? And maybe what happens 10 years from now is, is precisely because we followed the rules, we're using their technology with our data sitting on their server which which we can't control anyway. Mm. Um, how do you find a balance between those two? So in the US, this is actually a, a talking point in our current election discussions. They're talking about breaking up big tech, whatever that means. So, and they're specifically looking, I think, at Twitter, Facebook, Google, um, to like somehow dip, you know compartmentalize and segment it out. I have no idea how this would work, but they're literally thinking about regulating by, it's like what we, what we did with AT&T with the telecoms, mm. break it up make them into smaller and more controllable chunks. I don't know what's going to happen, but at least we're talking about it. And it has massive innovation implications if you try to package all that data and... Yeah, honestly, if we can break up Facebook, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying and exciting days and great last words on this panel. Your lunches are waiting for you. So uh, a big round of applause for this panel. <laughs> I'm out, 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 I'm out,